Thanks for coming, guys. And I, uh, unlike the previous talks, I don't have many cases to go through because we're going to be talking about new and novel things. Um, but I would, do want to go through some of the uh, data that is out there for these new and novel techniques and also talk about what is realistically going to be in your guys' hands in the next couple of years. So I am not bought and paid for. Does anyone know what this is, by the way? The two new cap? No, 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 no more. It's a Koenigsegg, Ruggiero. Anyway, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, you guys as dual trained uh, people uh, will have a lot of options at your fingertips uh, at when you graduate. And I wanted to talk about what is on the horizon in terms of what you can uh, think about philosophically and ethically as treatments. As an endovascular enterprise, I don't think we will be clipping many aneurysms in 10 years, probably no aneurysms in 20 years. Um, but they, the technology has come so far, but I, th I think that everyone has to take that with a grain of salt. We may never come to the point where endovascular is going to be able to treat every aneurysm, and I don't have that much optimism that it will be. And so that in terms of your own personal skill, uh, we have to figure out a way, whether it's by simulation, Dr. Dumont mentioned other ways of keeping up a neurosurgical education, going to high volume centers to get the extra experience is very important. The holy grail for the endovascular guys, the people in the endovascular field, especially in industry, is to be able to treat wide neck aneurysms accurately and well and, and do it to a point where you don't need retreatment. And obviously the blister type aneurysm is also another issue where the endovascular specialists are getting better and better at treating those. But will we ever get to that point where endovascular is king? I don't know yet. In, in designing this talk, I was trying to figure out what is the next thing beyond coils. Uh, you know, we know that if you don't tr coil an aneurysm completely, there is a chance that it will um, have a rebleed rate. There is a chance in the, especially in the, those patients who have ruptured aneurysms that are treating, those tend to have a higher rebleeding rate if the treatment is incomplete. And those are the uh, those are the arguments that are made by people around the country, people who are retired, my uh, past mentors and people I've admired in the surgical field in the past have all told me that that is the one reason why surgery will always be the treatment of choice for aneurysm for aneurysms in general. Uh, the radiologists used a paper by Drake in 1973, I'm not sure why, but they used that paper uh, when actually I would, I would argue that microsurgical technology wasn't as good as it is today in terms of what the rebleed rate is for, for residual aneurysms. Now, that Drake paper included Bazer apex aneurysms that were the worst of the worst at the time. Um, and so I think that there is something to be said there. That being, that being the case, there is a unique opportunity for uh, industry, you guys, to become the leaders in terms of thinking about what the next best endovascular technology would be beyond coils for the treatment of aneurysms. We heard Dr. Deshmukh talk about uh, pipeline device flow diverters in the future, the surpass device that just recently got, recently got approved, and other devices in Europe that are being used that will eventually make it to the US. So that being said, a recent study, this is called the Branch uh, Study, and I think it's very important just to look at. Uh, it, was a tr it was a study, multi-center study, looking at endovascular treatment for wide-necked uh, aneurysms, middle cerebral artery and basal apex aneurysms. The aneurysms are typically, especially the middle cerebral arteries, uh, aneurysms are typically treated with surgery. And they had a, what was unique about this study is that they had a core lab, and it's now kind of become in vogue to have a core lab that adjudicates whether or not the aneurysm is actually truly treated. The reason why this is important is because prior studies and studies that have uh, have happened in the recent past have used self-reporting or um, using some kind of inter-rate uh, inter reliability testing to make sure that they're not doing anything too off. But having a core lab actually testing whether or not, or looking at whether or not you have completely treated an aneurysm was very powerful in this case. 
In any event, you have multiple multiple centers of of, of very good um, very good sta standing treating these aneurysms and sending their data in. We'll talk a little bit more about the uh, Ramon Roy score, but that is a very important score that uh, lets us know how well we've treated an aneurysm and at least scores and at least allows us to compare different different aneurysms and different types of treatment. What is uh, key about this paper to know is that class one complete obliteration of the aneurysm as adjudicated by the core lab. Uh, the the um, follow up at I believe it's six months only thirty percent of of aneurysms showed complete occlusion uh, per the core lab when you're treating middle cerebral artery and basal apex uh, basal, basal apex um, uh, aneurysms so there is room for improvement and this is kind of a one of those more risk and pivotal studies that shows that at least for the surgical people people who are uh, surgeons uh, principally who would like to treat aneurysms that we may need to rethink endovascular treatment. Well, one of the, one of the um, when I went to Europe uh, last year and talked to a bunch of endovascular providers, uh, when I said that I was a neurosurgeon, they were just like, why the hell did you do that? Like, you, you should have just done radiology. Uh, and then you could have done the same thing. And we're doing so great out there. I'll come back to that a bit later. But um, I think that there is a lot to be said about having a balanced approach to patients uh, in terms of treatment uh, and, and at least having at least a partnership. If, if, if you're union trained, at least having a very close partnership with uh, surgeons. Uh, or if you're a surgeon, having a very close relationship with the radiology colleagues. But I think Europe has gone a little bit too far, uh, not having the balanced partnership uh, or dichotomies that exist. The Roy Ramon classification or Ramon Roy classification, as I mentioned, I just want to reiterate what it means. Uh, and class one is a complete obliteration of the aneurysm, including its neck. Class two is that there's some residual at the neck that you can actually notice on the angiogram. And class three and class uh, 3B, or class 3A, class 3B, suggest that there is some form of uh, filling of the aneurysm, whether it's around the side of the aneurysm or in, the, in its core. We'll get back to this a little bit more later, too, in, re in reference to new devices that are being tested in the US. A little bit about the science of, of where, this, where this Roy Ramon scale came from and why it's important and why coiling is so fundamentally different than clipping uh, from, a, from a scientific standpoint. It's, it's about what the coil mass is trying to do. The coil mass is trying to create thrombosis to form within the aneurysm and then encourage endothelium to actually cross the neck of the aneurysm. Now, with clipping, uh, the, just the physical uh, nature of the clips will bring tissue together a lot more efficiently than coiling a wide necked aneurysm. And so you're relying on the endothelialization, whether it's with a pipeline device or a set of coils that are filling the interface between the vessel wall, the parent vessel, sorry, and the aneurysm. You're asking a lot for some of those endothelial uh, cells to do, but it is successful and we do see good results from endovascular therapy, but knowing that for surgeons, we knew that putting two good, healthy tissue pieces together were going to actually cause better entheolization over time. Radiologists needed to prove that, so they did a study of, for themselves, but we already knew that as surgeons. The other thing I think is, is key to recognize is that a lot of devices that have been created uh, in the past have all, all been surrounded uh, by the people uh, designing these, engineers designing these uh, treatments based on spherical aneurysms. Aneurysms can be spherical, but I don't think the majority of them are. In our series here at Swedish, uh, when we last looked, 50% were what you consider spherical. Uh, but in reality, in, in large studies uh, in the past, only or less than 35% are truly spheres um, when you actually go back and look at the data. That has impacts on how you decide what, how to treat and what you want to treat in the future. And that leads me to the next device, uh, or the next uh, slide, which suggests that the device which has made it uh, in Europe, it's called the Medina device. It looks like an armadillo when it's completely uh, unsheathed. And so it, it's, it's, uh, it's supposed to be an intersacular device, a, a sort of a flow diverter, as it were, but sitting inside the aneurysm. I think there was a lot of promise with this device initially, uh, you know, when it, when it first came out. Um, because if you think about it, the leaflets have a, a large surface area, and it, because of that surface area, you're, you're encouraged to fill the neck of the, well, sorry, the dome of the aneurysm. The petals uh, tend to flare out. And as long as the petals are somewhere close to the base of the aneurysm, uh, next to the aneurysm parent vessel uh, interface, you're likely to get a good result. Now, this was designed for all saccular aneurysms. 
there are different subtypes, filler and framer. Uh, you could resheath it and, and just deploy it like a regular coil. So people who are used to coil technology, this was a great device for them to use. Now, um, the data uh, regarding this was brought out initially by um, Dr. Henke's lab in Germany. Uh, and they looked at the, the, the device, uh, not only on the bench, but also looking at the device in patients. Uh, testing has been done sporadically here in the US as well as in Europe. What is, the, the, what, is, what is key here, however, is the testing of the device and how that was rolled out in clinical studies. I think a lot of clinical studies initially were designed with this device in mind, but used as a device on its own or in relationship to coils. I think it was uh, probably mismanaged in terms of how, from an operator standpoint, what we expected the device to do. And the most recent paper, which was out of Karolinska, kind of actually said in their abstract, do never use this as a standalone device. And so I think that uh, the device itself requires a little bit of retooling and re, um, re rethinking in terms of how, it's, how it was designed and what its function is. I think it has a lot of powerful uh, components to it, but it remains to be seen whether it's going to make it to the US in the kind of current state that it is in, uh, in Europe, uh, in, in terms of the armadillo shape, its delivery catheter, and the way it acts, and its relationship to how we should treat aneurysms with coils as well. The next device, uh, Dr. Dumont had mentioned this, and Dr. Monteith had mentioned this too, is the Pulse Rider device. The Pulse Rider device uh, is, we, we've used it here. It actually is an interesting device that you've, you've played with in the lab now. It's a, it's actually acts as a scaffold. It has um, very little metal coverage, which allows you to be very flexible about entering in and out of it. Um, does not require uh, catheterization of other the branch vessels. You can use an O2 uh, an O an O2 one catheter to get the actual device in position. And once the device is in position and deployed, you can easily go through it and and treat it with regular coiling. Uh, the best study uh, from Dr. Mukherjee uh, suggested that you know it is very um, uh, the Roy Ramon scale can be. Uh, uh, very well, the aneurysms can be very uh, treated very well with the Leroy Ramon scale of one. Uh, and when we looked at uh, a retrospective review of many cases done recently, a, an article in from the World Neurosurgery looked at 63 patients. Majority of those were Bowser Apex, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the major complications with this device were thrombus formation, which can happen with most with with most metal metal pieces inside someone's brain. But the uh, again, the, this doesn't have as much metal as you would think as what, what how much a stent would have. A dissection happened in one of those cases. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, this, we're still looking at 66% occlusion at six months. So um, I think that there is still a lot of room for improvement in terms of the coiling. Now, this doesn't speak to the actual ease of use of the device and how, how it helped the, the neurosurgeon or the endovascular specialist when they were treating the aneurysm. Now, there's two different types of pulse, pulse rider. You probably heard about it next door. There's the Y-shaped and the T-shaped. Um, I put this diagram on its side because um, in Europe, they're treating MCA aneurysms uh, with the pulse rider. So I think you just think of this, uh, you know, uh, I think Europeans are crazy, but they're just uh, treating uh, MCA aneurysms uh, with the pulse rider device in combination with other stents. So you'll see the pulse rider device being used uh, now off, you know, kind of off-label in Europe. Uh, in association, in association with Atlas stents, in association with uh, Elvis stents, just to get the treatment required. Now, the reason why they're doing it is because you, you get your pulse rider in the, in the place that you want it, uh, and it protects the vessel that you want it, and then you can use the stent, since there's not much metal coverage here, w w uh, in addition to the pulse rider device, um, pretty comfortably without having many ma major issues. Um, I don't have any data. There's no data that's been published uh, that has been, um, I've just seen post presentations, I've seen abstracts being presented but with the data, I've seen videos about how an MCA has been treated with a pulse rider device. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily on label use at this time in the US, but that is coming. Um, I put this up there because when I did go internationally, um, 
the, the vast majority of aneurysms outside of the U.S., uh, outside of North America, I should say, are treated uh, endovascularly. Um, the Europeans have greater access to technology. Uh, their C mark designation uh, is a little bit more straightforward. Uh, South America lets uh, patients uh, be enrolled pretty straightforward. Uh, an IRB is not um, as hard to get through, or uh, you know, uh, or their version of the IRBs in other countries not as hard to get through. Um, but I did realize that 10% of all the specialists there did smoke. I did a kind of running tally as I was watching people coming in and out of conference. Um, it's it's worrying when you go to a stroke conference and there's a smoking designated area. Um, but so I think that there's much to be said there. Um, I want to spend a lot of time talking about this device because this device will be uh, in your hands. You guys are going to be fellows or practicing in the next couple of years, and you'll definitely be having this it, this device in your hands. It's it's come through its first initial FDA pre-submission phase, and I think they're just waiting for the FDA to give them the approval or green light. I think that I can't give you a timeline. I don't think the company will give you a timeline, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's in the next several months that you'll see this device. This device is a uh, abnormal uh, ab abluminal flow diverter. It's basically a sack or a, a braided um, nitinol sack that can sit within an aneurysm. It has different shapes uh, to it. Um, I'm not sure. Again, I can't speak to which shapes will make it to the US and which shapes uh, we'll be allowed to use in the US. Um, these are the ones that have been used in Europe. The catheters that re require to deploy this device are, are large, but again, I don't know what the company is going to design eventually. Uh, we might get a 021 catheter to be able to deploy some of these in certain aneurysms. Uh, and what's nice about this device, as it sits in an aneurysm, is that it will um, avoid you using dual antiplatelet therapy. So nice for ruptured cases, uh, nice for cases where you can't use um, pl Plavix or, or some form of equivalent. The delivery system uh, is pretty straightforward as well. Um, it's getting, it, as, as it's evolved since it first was designed by another smaller company that was gobbled up by a bigger company, uh, the technology has improved in terms of its uh, deployment and detachment. Um, I don't think there's anything fancy to talk about there. But what is key, what is key is that because of this, this device, we have a, um, a new way of strategizing how, how the aneurysm is occluded. So we talk about Roy Ramon scale, they had to come up with an entire new scale uh, to evaluate this device, which is interesting because you know now we're talking about the web occlusion scale. Uh, so the device is occlusion scale because uh, in Europe they weren't convinced that some of the recurrences were true recurrences. Was it safe? How do we get the device to be approved or um, by not by approved by any any federation or, or government, but have approved have the approval of the physicians using the device? Um, the occlusion scale has four components, essentially the bottom components C and D are failures of the device where you see some neck remnant, remnant uh, and, or some leakage of, uh, of uh, blood around the device itself. Uh, if you just see a little bump uh, there, which th that suggests that that's just the bottom of the device and that's not actually a recurrence. A and B are actually treatments, uh, completed treatments, so B is okay. Um, now, uh, in Europe, I've seen uh, these, this device being de deployed. In Germany, uh, what they were trying to do is if you did see D, they would try to squeeze a catheter in that little space there and try to coil it off. And that looks like a, just, just sounds like an awful idea. Um, but you know, the, the whole new uh, occlusion scale is just, an, just another test or another, another sign that technology is continuing to move uh, how we think about aneurysms and how we discuss aneurysms in the future. But let's get the uh, let's get the data. So here's here, here's the three data, and I talk about the branch study that first slide just to bring it back full circle. So in comparison, and, and what kind of aneurysms were treated in the two diff in, in the in the three different studies over here, you have the cumulative web studies, which is three studies: Webcast one or Webcast, Webcast two, and the French observatory study or the FROB study, uh, or the uh, basically uh, practice studies that. You kind of use, and that's the combination of what that was, what what their clinical experience was. You have a, a ruptured aneurysm series that used web, and you have the branch study, which was basically the wide neck aneurysm, but not using web, but all under endovascular techniques. So just a comparison, just to, of the of the groups that there are, um, the aneurysm diameters, as you can tell by the French study, were significantly larger. I think there's a little bit of a difference in what kind of aneurysms were treated uh, in the ruptured series. There were only five percent were were Bazer, the rest were were MCA. Uh, and ACOM, which is interesting, and then the um, 
other series of, of, of branch, or the other interesting thing about the cumulative web series is that there's a lot of MCA aneurysms being treated. So those are the kind of you know European studies that were kind of pushing uh, this device uh, through, and what are, this is the data that's actually going to the FDA, or the FDA is perusing right now um, when it was when it was submitted. And here's the actual important slide about what the success rate and complete occlusion was based on the web occlusion scale. So complete occlusion or net remnant versus aneurysm remnant and adequate, adequate, adequate occlusion was that weird kind of uh, pseudo neck remnant category. Uh, so in branch, we knew that it was 30%. I talked about that initially complete occlusion. Uh, and if you look at rupture series, it's interesting that it's much higher. Uh, but in the cumulative web series, a little bit higher too, 50%. So when looking at what we have currently for wide neck aneurysms and uh, the branch study, you know, we have some of the best people in the country doing this study and con conducting the study, getting a 30% success rate versus what the web has been able to show in Europe. Now, I'm not saying that, that that's going to happen here in Europe, in North America, because we tend to have a little bit of different d data and different data points. But we also, I think, have to be very careful when we look at this data because the web occlusion scale is going to really dictate how we f feel confident as providers whether or not the aneurysm is treated. So it remains to be seen how, in our hands, North Americans, it will end up being, but we'll see. And I just want to wrap this up as a final word as well um, that, uh, you know, I think that like I spoke about before, there's a very easy tendency for us to um, kind of get pigeonholed as endovascular specialists. Um, as dual trained people, uh, I think that there has to be a way to continue keeping up your surgical skills. So that includes uh, participating in fellowships, courses like this. Um, otherwise, we'll end up uh, not having the ability to treat certain aneurysms in the future. And that, with that, I'll finish. Any questions? You know, I was looking at that branch study really closely, and I'm, I'm like, if you guys are only getting 30% complete occlusion at six months with some of your wide neck aneurysms, why aren't you clipping them? You know, like, why aren't you clipping these aneurysms? And I think that's one of the things that I, I get concerned about, you know, the, the way that things are marching. And similarly with this study, I think there's a really huge issue that, you know, if you're not getting adequate results, it's going to play out in North America a lot different than it is in Europe. Uh, these are European studies, and that's going back to that you know whole thing. Like I think that we are a little bit more discerning as people treating aneurysms and looking at aneurysms more objectively, a little bit probably than the technology. Set. And that goes back to the slide where 90% of Europeans are um, endovascular specialists treating purely endovascularly. Um, I met a guy from Edinburgh. If you're looking for a job, Edinburgh has an amazing job. So does Glasgow. There's a one guy in Glasgow and one guy in Edinburgh. Those are the only two guys in Scotland that do endovascular. The guy in Glasgow in three months had coiled 100 aneurysms. And because he's the only guy. And when the other guy goes on holiday, the other guy gets all the aneurysms in Scotland. Nothing goes be below Hadrian's Wall. Uh, and that's about it. So if you're looking for a good job, Scotland's the way to go. But yeah, I think that you know, the Europeans, they, you know, the surgeons there, and you know this, Steve, too, the surgeons there don't want to treat aneurysms. They want to play golf at 4 p.m. The neurosurgeons do. Uh, you know, you know, they they want to go to St. Andrews at four and not have to worry about that subarachnoid that showed up. Meanwhile, we as idiots are just like four centimeter aneurysms came in at 4 p.m. Let's do it. You know, and that's not the philosophy there. Um, I find it interesting that um, uh, one of our fellows, uh, Muhammad, has brought up a meta analysis looking at clipping of middle cerebral artery aneurysm versus coiling and the recurrence rate. Uh, the outcome was similar. Uh, you know, if you look at this, if there's 
staff uh, have an aneurysm rendering. Uh, the sort of aneurysms that we're going to be treating uh, with surgery in the future are going to be these disasters uh, where they've got a web device sitting in the bad or apex and you've got no good uh, in the vascular organ other than maybe a photoburner or something. Uh, or like you said, trying to sneak a microcap on the side of the web device or something. So it's going to create a whole new skill set uh, and, and the, the fellows are going to be learning how to deal with these awful cases. Well, I'd like to hear what the other guy, the faculty have to say. I, think I saw, um, you know, uh, from all the cases that have been presented, there are cases where, you know, you you, you, you do endovascular, think going in there, thinking that's the best thing for the patient, and unfortunately, you know, several weeks later, they have a recurrence. They have coils in there. They have stents in there. What do you do next? Sometimes salvage therapy is, um, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't recommend like going in there surgically and stop pulling out coils and stents and re re reconstructing stuff, but it has happened, you know? It reminds me of Lucy's first patient, the uh, guy from the Philippines with that ACOM. Stick one, one web in there, be fine. It's cheap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>